For our final video spotlight, we get to speak with Bill Martin and Craig Bachman about their individual works and their collaborative pieces for the 3D faculty exhibition. Don't forget to check out the full online show at bannistergallery.omica.net. And thank you so much for joining us on this tour. My name is Bill Martin. I teach sculpture, wood and metal sculpture here at the college, and I also teach all the 3D foundations classes as well. Um, we're looking at some of my sculptures that are inspired by lots of fragments of machinery, uh, inspired by uh, different kinds of um, evolution in evolution of machinery and technology and evolution kind of inspired also by uh, biological evolution. I'm doing a lot of reading um, popular science kind of things, particularly I found early on um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's writings about how um, the chanciness and um, non-linearity linearity the way that um, evolution and mechanical invention sort of works together and the sort of weird uh, unusual examples that come out of those that, that um, we sort of think of things being optimized all the time but a lot of times we end up with sort of humorous examples and um, and oddballs and I find those to be more uh, visually interesting and also more uh, telling about the process of how those things came about. Uh, the pieces are um, very much about handmade craftsmanship. I sort of enjoy those processes, as well as I think that instead of a uh, object that looked like it was made by an R&D team and a, uh, a lab, it looks more like the sort of lone inventor sort of trying things out and sometimes getting it right, sometimes getting things wrong. Uh, the uh, physical beauty of making things out of the materials is really important to me. and. Um, so I think that's what I got for right now. I'm kind of running out of thoughts. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the scale of this piece? I mean, certainly it's the largest work in the entire show, yeah, um, yeah. and yours, your works, I've seen other examples, are always very large scale and sort of very, um, if not interactive, it really navigates the space for the viewer. Uh, so could you just talk a little bit about why you choose uh, this size? Yeah, the scale of the pieces are important in that they get big enough to have a bodily physical presence with the viewer. Uh, these actually are coincidentally about my size and a lot of them tend to be sort of on that scale and I really find it interesting uh, the way that say like a boat or an airplane has a, a stronger physical presence when it's on land or when you're walking up to the airplane on the tarmac the, the physical presence that object has is stronger than when it's flying or when the boat's floating out in the ocean. And that's kind of a really strong influence for me for the pieces that I want that something about that kind of physical presence. And, and you have to get to a certain scale to have that kind of influence. And you'll also see that idea of like a boat that sort of has this, um, it doesn't have a bottom when it's on the land, it's propped up on stands and it sort of floats. You'll see a lot of the sculptures where there are elements like that sort of suspended one inside of the other and that's sort of floating and, um, and I, th I find that to be uh, and also kind of an interesting way to get to the sort of physical sense of form and mass in the sculptures. You talk about doing research on scientific invention. Is this piece specifically referencing a historical machine piece or uh, an invention of sorts? Uh, it's titled Plug Joint, and most of my titles kind of refer back to, if you look at the names of early inventions, they had names that sort of alluded to function, uh, and they were a lot of times compound words uh, that, that were sort of fantastic, and I, I kind of title my pieces in a similar kind of tradition, I tend to make them slightly sillier because I also see these as kind of giant toys. So they're meant to be playful. They're, um, the, the, the accordion shaped pieces up here, they're sort of like cultivator discs on a, a plow in the Midwest where they, they turn the soil over, but they also look like plastic toys. I remember these kind of accordion baby toys. So they're kind of playing around with serious things, playful things, small things, large things. So they're kind of drawing from all sorts of different scale and different references and things like that. I find that the, the sort of linkage up here, it looks like 
some sort of mechanical fastening, but it's also made out of multiple bars of metal, so it kind of also looks like some kind of plumbing that you might find on the back of a refrigerator or under the hood of your car or something like that. So they're, they're kind of tapping into a lot of things that look functional and you kind of recognize them from a lot of different sources, but they're added up in a way where they don't really quite make sense, but they're still sort of together in a way that's believable, they're sort of beautiful, they're, they're playful. Uh, that's really the, kind of the goal. And you talk about the, the sort of hand craftsmanship quality of these works. Where do you source the materials from and how do you, you know, how do you actually build this? How do you go about starting this project? These are pretty ordinary material, materials. This is just uh, steel from a local steel vendor and that's pretty much the steel throughout this particular piece. Uh, the, the wood is, I think they're maple strips and they have an auto body uh, filler for sort of smoothing out dents and things like that that has been forced down in between the individual strips. Most of it is about the painted surface and how I'm sort of layering down a few layers of slightly different color paints and then sanding back through it. So in that way, the surface that I'm getting is more important than the material of this one. Uh, you will see in some pieces though where I am being more careful about the kinds of materials I see, things like leather, on some of them, feathers on some pieces, uh, different kinds of liquid. There's one that has uh, um, antifreeze, like automotive antifreeze inside it, but I use its chemical name, which is um, ethylene glycol, just because it sounds more mad inventor, kind of uh, sounding with it using its chemical title. Uh, so sometimes the materials are important, sometimes it's does it have the right working properties to make the form that I need, and then I can sort of adjust the surface to what I want on top of that material. And lastly, what are some of the details that you wish uh, people could see if they could come into the actual gallery itself? Uh, I think on this piece, it is the surfaces that I think are missing there. I find them to be very um, painterly in the way that they've, they've been developed and layered. Even the rust on the metal parts that was developed from just making the piece and then sitting out in the rain and the rain ran down the facets of it and made stripes on it and I find that to be really beautiful. It's something that you'll see on found pieces that are out. They have this sort of natural surface that comes from being weathered and that, that's, you know, I was fascinated by old abandoned machinery as a kid and a lot of that kind of surface treatment and aging and things like that is part of the pieces that I think uh, in a photo doesn't really come through. And as well, I mentioned the, the physical presence of what the piece lying there feels like when you're standing next to it. That's something that you can't get in video. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Craig Bachman. I run the ceramics department here at Rhode Island College. And these are the works that I've included in the 3D faculty show. Um, this work started out from, I needed a vessel for my mother who was just cremated and we put her into a tomb with one of my larger vessels that she enjoyed her whole life. So after that, I kind of sat down and made a bunch just to kind of get over that. And I made 30 jars and these are the 10 that I selected for the show. Why these 10 specifically? Um, I, we, I set them up all together and we just kept rotating through sort of which ones went together well. I liked some of them better than others that I still have at home, but I felt that this group of ten in two sets of five worked well together. And can you talk about the textures? I, I love how each vessel has its own very unique texture and design and color pattern. How do you choose that? My work evolved because of being doing production for years. So I've always done production and I've always thrown or cast or something like that. Um, so it was sort of a experiment with different te textures and surfaces. I like surfaces that you can touch and feel or have you can respond to in different ways even though most people don't touch them in the gallery. Um, so as I started to experiment, Experimenting, I started with these and then I moved to these and then I moved the ones over here that have just the top part that was kind of um, 
have color or just dots on them. So it kind of became more and more subtle almost as I moved along. And it was sort of the progression of just the way I work as far as throwing and manipulating the surface. I've been asking all of the faculty artists this, but what do you start with? Do you start with a sketch or a design or do I you don't. start? I don't start with, I start by sitting down and starting to make things. And usually I make four or five that I really just don't like and they start to evolve into shapes or sizes. My, this, these are a lot smaller than a lot of the ones that I used to make. Um, and at first, the, the first probably four or five I made were in this range here. And then as I started to get smaller, I started to concentrate more on the surface and the pattern, especially like this top pattern on this one or even the little subtle ones right there. Um, and how that sort of come, came into play with the scale. How exactly are these vessels fired? They're fired to cone six oxidation. And can you talk a little bit about what that means for those oh, sorry. of us who it's, don't um, know? So that. they're fired in electric kilns. Um, they're all uh, glazes that I made. I don't think any of these are commercial glazes that you buy. So they're, I, make, I have a glaze place in my studio that, and they're all sprayed. Um, the inside's glazed usually the same color. Um, and then they're fired in an electric kiln to cone six, which is about 2200 degrees. And uh, we just saw on, on camera that you can take the little tops off right. uh, these vessels. Can you, you know, talk about how do you design them all together as one sort of entity and then separate them or do you design the caps separately and add them as afterwards? I do the, top, the, the, the lids at the same time. I might do two jars and then two lids, but you know, I'm thinking about like, I probably did these two on the same day because they have the same type of lid, which I was starting to play with at that point. Um, the lids that are similar, I might do a couple on the same day. There's a couple over there that are a little different that I might um, try something new on a new day. I'd probably throw like five or six a day, finish them all the way through for the lid, the jar, um, trim them and everything. So it depends on what I'm thinking about that day. Um, as far as designing, I just design by throwing. These were early, these were in the middle, these ones here were later. So the progression through, even though this is fairly busy, these got to be a little too busy. These were kind of subtle, then I went to the, sort of the busyness of this surface, and then I backed off into these, sort of the progression of the way I made them. How do you achieve these patterns? Like what's the technical process? Um, what I do is I throw almost a cylinder shape, and then I'll add a colored slip to this surface here, and then I carve into it while it's still upright and then when I shape it, I shape it from just the inside without touching the outside so that it crackles and makes these patterns. Same with this. This was a straight cylinder that I poked dots. That's why the dots here are bigger than here because they stretched out. And how do you decide uh, what order they get displayed in? I just set them on my back porch and we just kept go moving them around with all 30 of them or whatever, 25 of them sitting there until we decided, all right, well at first you only wanted three. <laughs> so we started to do that and then we decided that five looked better, but we had 10 that I liked. So that we said, okay, let's go with two groups of five. That's sort of the whole point about it. So it very much varies depending on the exhibition space. Yes, you know, I mean, I knew we had enough room here. I thought the two, two shelves would look better than just one shelf of three. I think they look marvelous. Thank you for bringing them in. And I like that they were a little bit tighter than just three on a pedestal. At first we talked about three and I like that it has the five on there. All right. Thank you so much, Craig. You're welcome. So we're looking at one of your collaborative pieces, the many collaborative, three collaborative pieces that you've included in this show. Can you talk a little bit about how you start? I mean, you talk in your statements about how you pass the work from one artist to another. But I'm curious, who starts the work then? And do you start with sketches or do you just sort of play based on impulse? Well, we play and it depends on which piece we're looking at and we can probably describe which one starts what, but I started this one. So my pieces came to Bill um, finished and then Bill took them and worked on his middle section and then the knob. Yeah, they, they can start for either one of us. Uh, sometimes Craig gets an idea for something he thinks it would be 
an interesting form he wants to make, would be an interesting challenge to hand off to me. And that's part of the fun is kind of, you know, setting up a challenge for the, for, uh, for the other person. And um, so the piece back here, the wooden metal part started first on that one. So I gave that to Craig and he made the ceramics parts for it. As Craig mentioned, this one started off with the ceramic parts and I filled in the wooden metal parts afterwards. So it can go either way. Right. I think that one, I started. No, maybe not. Maybe I started that one. Yeah, I started that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, 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 they go back and forth. And I like the idea of sort of the surprise when I get them back or I see them later. Bill usually has the final touch on them just because he's usually gluing my parts in and doing the final finish. But it's nice to see the progression from when I hand him the piece to what, what shows up. Sometimes his pieces are a little more dominant, some pieces sometimes mine are. And it's not really a conscious effort, I don't think, on either one of our parts. It's just how they go together. Yeah, I get the last say just by default because the materials that I'm working on, I can fit them to Sir Craig's ceramic parts. Once Craig's ceramic parts have been fired and glazed and finished, the sizes on them are kind of set. So I have more flexibility to, to fit them. So I tend to be the one that finishes them. Is there a general theme that you're working on when you, you know, create these pieces? We have worked on kind of two themes, whether, and it's just simply how they're displayed. Do they go on the wall or do they go on the pedestal? So we kind of have two sort of sub-series in the series going along. Um, I kind of kept, one of the first wall pieces was a three-section part, and I've kind of kept that theme going a little bit, that it's like a three-component part um, to go on the wall. The pedestal-mounted pieces, um, those started mostly because well, we wanted to put some pieces on the pedestal, but also I had some big chunks of spalted maple that actually came from Craig's backyard that I thought were really beautiful. But I also wanted to challenge myself to uh, turn some pieces of wood and then modify them after they came off the lathe. So I'm using a technique, kind of like his pottery techniques, but then because they're wood, I, I have some ability to sort of shape and modify them afterwards. So that sort of generated my parts for them. And I think we're both very mechanical. So, you know, when Bill talks about coming through, that's the first thing I saw. So I saw an image where I could create something that I thought of a, a through way through it, and then I just figured out how can I relate that to the bottom of, of the stand. So this was more of a stand here to me, and then the top part was more of just kind of responding to what he gave me. All of our pieces were wall pieces for the first three or four in the series we started making. So then we decided to, um, change it up a little bit for one, for a little bit more excitement, but also to fit on pedestals around and be a little, little more, I don't know about user friendly, but they'd be, they, they would fit sort of the gallery spaces a little easier. Yeah, sort of a different challenge too. When we put something on the wall, we can make any sort of bracket or hanger to, to hang something on the wall. These, because now they've got to stand up, it kind of seemed like an interesting challenge again for me to give to Craig, say, okay, I've got this thing that doesn't have a bottom on it anywhere. How are you going to make it stand up? Right. And there's one that still isn't standing up, right? Because I made it where it balanced out of the far side. That one I changed around a lot right. to make it stand up right. because right. it was so, right. Right. It's, it, it actually picked up some themes of another piece. Right. So sometimes we think they're going somewhere. Like when Bill gave it to me, he thought it was going a different direction than I took it. And my direction didn't work very well. <laughs> or at least it didn't stand very well. And with this piece, especially in the ceramic section, you can see sort of similarities uh, between this individual work and the works that you created for the show, Craig. Um, so how much of this piece do you think of as sort of being part yours and part Bill's, and how much do you think of it as being all together a collaborative creation? I see them all as just collaborative. I don't think any of them, I think that one there is a little more Bill than me maybe because just a sheer volume of Bill's work. I feel like sometimes Bill's work is a little more intense than mine. My work might go on a little, I, I probably make my pieces in a couple of days where Bill might labor over them a lot longer, but I also make three or four tries usually. So it probably adds up the same, but on that piece over there, Bill probably has a lot more hours than I do. So most of them I see is, the other two is equal parts, and it, yeah, it doesn't I, really matter. I'm not. I like the fact that they're like, say for instance, the one we were looking at earlier with the fins on it. It has a mechanical, functional uh, 
quality like my sculptures do, but it's sort of vessel-like now because it's got kind of jar top and bottom to it. So it's like my mechanical things become a jar, his vessels have become sculpture. So they're kind of not exactly either one of our previous work, but you can definitely see the lineage in there. All right. Wonderful. Either way, we hope that you all keep making these together and keep <laughs> exhibiting them in our 3D faculty show. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Phil and Craig.